Right, hello and welcome back to another video. Um, this week we're going to have a look at how we can start to recreate this effect. Um, you might recognize this from the Unreal 5 demo, um, but it's also here available uh, in the 4.27 content examples. Um, it's a very complex effect, there's a lot going on, so we're going to try and simplify it down. Uh, and it's going to take a few videos, I think, to go over everything uh, that this effect is kind of doing. So. Um, yeah, if you want to follow along, um, this is the content examples level uh, that comes with the uh, launcher. So if you go over to the uh, Epic Games launcher in the Un Unreal Engine tab, uh, you have the Learn tab, and there's loads of good content in here. Uh, and this first one here is the content examples. So if you make sure that you've got the 427 uh, latest update, it might be in 426 as well, but definitely in 427, uh, you have the Niagara advanced level so here with the level filter on it's two niagara levels this one niagara advanced some really good content in here some good examples for um for learning and so uh all i've done is to open this up and then broken down what each piece is doing and i'm going to recreate it um hopefully in a sort of simpler way uh, and we'll see how we get on with that so um that's there if you want to follow along and sort of dig into it yourself um and this is where we're going to be ending up by the end of today's video. Uh, so we've got our meshes, they're spawning in uh, and they're following the surface uh, and they're sort of moving around with a little bit of random movement to them. So uh, not completely uh, copied one to one yet, um, but a good starting point uh, and some interesting things happening in here. So uh, this will be where we're gonna end up today. Uh, and then hopefully in future videos we'll um, update the meshes and try and kind of like refine this just a little bit more. So. Okay, well let's get started. So I'm just gonna hide the existing one uh, and start with a brand new Niagara system. Um, I'm just gonna do this in the system level. Uh, NS class, uh, what do we call it? Um, align to surface. Uh, and I'm gonna start with just an empty emitter as well. Okay. So the first thing I'm going to do is actually spawn some particles. Uh, there's none here. So in our emitter update, um, we're going to do a spawn first instantaneous. Uh, and I'm going to spawn about 50 particles for now. That's just sort of a decent number to start with. <coughs> and they're all spawning there. Um, this is now uh, particles living for a five second duration uh, and it's looping. So our system is, is sort of looping around. Um, I'm gonna change this to just be a, a once loop behavior. And now our particles will spawn and after five seconds, they'll die. In the viewport here, it's immediately gonna reset for sort of um, convenience. Uh, but if I actually bring this into the world, we'll see that after five seconds, these are gonna die off and they're not gonna respawn. So that's not what we want. We want our particles to live forever. Uh, and the way we're going to do that is just turn off kill particles when lifetime has elapsed here in particle state. So we've got a one-time spawn, particles that just live forever. Uh, that's not the same setup as is in the content examples. They've actually got a 30 second loop. Um, <coughs> but I think this works better for, um, for at least for this purpose for now. So that's how we're going to set that up. Now we're not using a sprite. We're going to be using meshes. Uh, and so I'm going to add a mesh renderer. And the mesh I'm going to use, uh, I have imported, uh, what do I call it? Swarm mesh placeholder, there it is. Um, let me just open this up. So this is just a, a quick, simple placeholder mesh that I've made. Uh, it's sort of a curved conical arrow thing. Um, but the important thing is it's got some directionality to it. We can see whether that's pointing forwards. We can see whether it's sort of aligned to the surface. Um, and that's going to give us kind of the bits that we need and then later on, obviously, we can replace this with a beetle or whatever kind of mesh we're, um, we're kind of like going to be using. Um, but it's a good placeholder for now. Um, yeah. And there we are. Um, we are spawning 50 particles, but they're all on top of each other. So I'm going to add a box location uh, and just spawn them inside a volume. Um, now I'm actually going to make a parameter for this and we'll see why later because we're going to be using this in one of our modules. Uh, and it's also good, it just exposes the value then to the sort of uh, to the level editor side um, to make it easy to edit. Uh, so this is going to be a vector uh, and we'll call this box extents. 
box size, something like that. And we just plug that in. Um, this will be defaulting back to zero, uh, but if we select our system, we can see our user parameter defaults here. And we'll just set that to be something like 500. And so we've just got a simple volume, spawning mesh particles, uh, and then they're all kind of pointing the same way and everything. And I'm just going to place this in the world somewhere inside this rock. Um, okay. Now, the module we're going to be using uh, to do an awful lot of the work here is the um, nearest move to nearest distance field surface GPU. Um, so we'll just add that in uh, and see what happens. Um, we're going to get a compile error. So this has the word GPU uh, in the title uh, and it'll come up with our log error here saying this does not work on CPU sims. So um, the, the technique we're using um, needs to be a GPU emitter. So up in emitter properties, if we change that to a GPU compute sim, um, we're going to get a warning instead of the compile error. Uh, and the warning here is saying the fixed bounds are missing. Um, and so to fix that, I'm just actually going to go up here to the bounds drop down, uh, set the fixed bounds for emitters, and that will enable it and set it to be about the same as our box extents. Um, something to note, if you did edit the box extents to be bigger, you'd have to come in here and set the fixed bounds differently. Uh, this can't be parameterized, unfortunately. So just a little gotcha there. Um, this kind of box extents is kind of set to a maximum uh, of whatever the fixed bounds is. Otherwise, you'll get clipping errors. Um, if you want to know more about that, I did a video about bounds a while back. You can go and check that out. And there's more information about that kind of thing there. OK, so what's this doing? Well, it's doing the a uh, thing here. Uh, move to nearest distance surface field. Well, we don't have any mesh, mesh distance fields in our preview window. But if we go back to our viewport, I might try and split screen this a little, um, you can see that it's done it. Or well, it's done something. Uh, it's moved to the mesh distance field. Um, well, what is that? Well, if we go to our view, our show menu here, we can visualize mesh distance fields. Um, and that's what that looks like. So it's a voxelized representation of the world inside every single kind of point. The value it gives you is how far you are from the nearest surface. Um, so you can see here it's got the sort of mock mesh defined, uh, it's got the ground plane defined. Um, and what that allows us to do is make really kind of cheap calculations uh, on the GPU um, to know where we are. Um, you can use it in materials, you can use it for lighting, uh, and we can also obviously use it for particles here. Um, it is a project setting, so if you don't have those options, um, if we go up here, mesh distance, uh, generate mesh distance fields uh, needs to be enabled, uh, and that will then kind of calculate all those uh, meshes, um, all the distance fields, um, and then you can then sort of refer back to them later on. Um, something to note, they are relatively cheap to use at runtime, but they have quite a large memory footprint, depending on your levels uh, and the sort of the density and um, what's the word, like accuracy that you're going for with your mesh distance field. Um, so depending on what sort of um, end product you're putting out, um, they may not be applicable for your project. Um, but obviously for here, we're going to need to send them on uh, and it won't go back and generate. That will require an engine restart uh, if you do enable that, but obviously I've already done that. Um, so that's our mesh distance field. One more caveat with that. Um, they don't respond very well to non-uniform scaled objects, at least last time. Oh, maybe they're better now. Um, okay. Well, that was a, a gotcha that used to exist. Maybe it's okay now, but um, just be a little bit careful with, um, with your mesh distance fields. There are settings inside of the static mesh editor. Um, if we do mesh distance, um, so this should be set to mesh distance field generate. Where are we? Um, there's things you can do with the placement meshes. Um, somewhere in here, there's obviously a lot of settings. Uh, distance field replacement mesh. Um, distance field resolution scale, yeah. So you can up your 
um, resolution scale, and it should now, if it rebuilds in a second, um, will give us a slightly higher resolution um, for this mesh. So um, there's a load of documentation about it. You can go and read more about mesh distance fields. That's not the uh, focus of this video, but we are going to be using them. So good to know a little bit about them. Uh, okay, so let's go back to our default view uh, and have a look at our particles. So what's happened is they've moved to the nearest distance um, distance field surface. There is an option here for kill by distance. If we set that down to something like 50, uh, if it would have to move more than 50 units, uh, it just kills the particle off. So you can kind of um, control that if your spawning particles really far in the middle of nowhere, um, you can control that these don't get kind of pushed to the near surface and just get killed off instead. Uh, but apart from that, it does a lot of what we want, um, pushing our meshes to the uh, to the surface. Cool. Now these meshes are all currently um, pointing the same direction, although they've been moved, they haven't been aligned. Um, and so we're gonna add a new module and it's gonna be orient, uh, orient mesh to vector. Um, <clears throat> and you can see immediately we've got some uh, changes here uh, but what we want is we want to know where the surface normal is in that distance field because um, that will give us sort of the, the shape of the surface um, so what can we do well if we go up to our move to nearest surface let's have a look at the parameter rights in here and we can see there's a few things being written through this module, one of them is this vector to nearest surface normal, um, and so that's going to give us effectively the the upwards normal um, of our um, of our mesh as it's moved, as of our surface that we're attached to. Uh, and so, if I go to my orient mesh to vector, if I put in the lookout direction, uh, if I can find the right thing, move to different surface. It's a bit difficult with the scaled UI. This bottom one here. A sec to compile uh, and we haven't got the right axis but it's doing something you can see they're all scaled differently uh, we need to change the up axis direction uh, no we don't that's wrong we need to change the reference action axis direction um, now I know because I've done this before uh, that we're changing the reference axis vector to minus z so that's to do with the direction that we're getting from our move to nearest surface distance surface um, and then the uh, orientation of the, mo the model we, we imported um, uh, but you can obviously just trial and error that until you get the right orientation uh, and we'll have a look what's happened here the ones on the floor haven't really changed but here where it's attached to the rock now they're kind of changing their orientation so that they're kind of aligning with the surface normal uh, which is what we want which is quite cool and the last thing we want to do in our setup uh, in our um, spawn section uh, is we want to randomize them so we want them to first be aligned to the surface but we also want them to be kind of like a random orientation so we'll add another module uh, and that is uh, mesh initial mesh orientation and I'm just going to set the rotation here to be a random range vector uh, 0 to 1 in Z and we'll see that they're rotating um, in different orientations here. Uh, what that has done though is it's broken the ones that are aligned to the rock. Um, so quick fix, we can just swap the order of those and what that will now do is it will randomize our orientation and then it will align the surface to the rock. Um, and we're getting some interpenetration errors here. That's going to be a little bit unavoidable. These are quite big meshes. Um, we're, we're only treating our particles as a single point and then we're assigning a mesh to that. And so the point is correct, but because the mesh is quite big, we're going to get some interpenetration, uh, and we'll have a look at how we might be able to fix that in some um, in some later videos, I think. Um, but for now, we're just going to sort of accept that that's a thing, uh, and if we wanted to, we could scale our uh, our mesh down. If I put this down to something 0 0.1, 0 0.2. Obviously, the smaller the mesh, the less penetration you're going to get between things. Um, but also the harder it is to see for the sake of this video. So I'm just going to keep them a little bit oversized for now, maybe 0.51, something like that. Um, all right, so that's our sort of initial setup. Uh, we've spawned in meshes, we've moved them to the nearest distance field, uh, and we've randomly oriented them 
um, so they're facing in different directions. That's a pretty, pretty easy setup. Um, just a few inbuilt modules uh, and could be really useful for all sorts of kind of scattering particles across surfaces. Um, but we also might want them to move uh, and there's a bit more to that. So uh, in our particle update here, uh, firstly, all I'm going to do is just add a bit of curl noise. Um, it's going to give me an error because I'm not having uh, the soul forces and velocity here. Remember, I started from an empty, and so we need to have a soul forces and velocity in here as well. And if we just fix the issue, it will add that for us. Uh, well, that's not working, is it? We've got curl noise being added, um, but our particles are obviously coming off the surface. Uh, and there's a couple of ways we can solve this. Um, we'll, we'll do it the kind of like slightly easier way, uh, which has some limitations, and then we'll talk about how we can do a more complex one uh, and how we can implement what has been implemented in the content examples. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do uh, is just try using this module again, move to nearest distant surface. Um, it worked the first time around. If we add some noise, um, it's going to keep our meshes um, on the surface. Uh, and that sort of works. That's the quick and easy way. Um, there's still some issues. Yeah, fine. Um, but they're not moving along the directions. They're not moving along the surface normal. Um, but this kind of works for if you had, I don't know, little nondescript blobs, something like that, that didn't have any directionality, uh, you could get away with this. But we want our meshes to be aligned with the surface or aligned with their, uh, their sort of direction of travel. Um, and the way we're going to do that is by using a flight orientation module. Um, so now what should be happening is our meshes are following the sort of surface, uh, following the direction of travel, um, but there's still an issue. They're still kind of rotating uh, and coming off, um, not really sort of looking like they're attached to that surface. Um, and so we're going to have to get into a custom module. Just going to quickly edit the, uh, the settings here. This is designed for something that's quite kind of tiny. Um, we're just going to have much lower banking values. And that's going to control how much it sort of fits when it rotates. Um, maybe just copying the values here from uh, the, uh, the example. Uh, and obviously you can kind of edit these and see what they're doing. Um, but we need to fix what's happening here. So if we go back to our content example, um, if I just open the system on its own. Um, as I say, there is a lot going on within this system. Um, and so hopefully commented out here at the side, um, but a lot of it isn't being used for this sort of specific section. Um, and so the way I've kind of debugged this is kind of gone in and, and sort of broken it down step by step. Um, and the modules that are going to be helpful now, or the one we want here, is this thing here, crawl tangentially to the distance field. Um, because that's going to give us our kind of movement along our, our sort of surface. Um, if we open this up, it's a scratch pad module in here. There's so much stuff on screen. Um, and we're just going to break out down what it's doing. So um, align the per particles to the surface and push the velocity into the ground plane. So what this is saying is it's going to take the, the normal of the surface that the particle's on, and it's going to take our random velocity, and it's just going to project it down. Uh, if we have a look here, we have our project vector on plane. So the plane that we're going to create is from the surface normal, and the vector is going to be our input velocity that's coming from our curl noise. And it's basically just going to say, well, let's project that down. So effectively, kind of make sure that you're always moving along that surface normal. Uh, and that's going to fix our, our problem. Um, in fact, only this first bit is necessary to fix our problem because we're using that other module and pushing things back to the um, to the surface. Uh, that's the sort of hacky, quicker way. Uh, if we have a look a bit more into this module, it gets a little bit more complicated. Um, what it's actually doing here in the content examples, and we'll do this in a future video, I think, um, is it's taking three samples, one at the um, sort of center point of our mesh, and then it's got a little bit further forwards, a little bit further back, and it's doing three samples here, um, find if it's different find nearest distance field surface uh, and just averaging them. So taking the three of them, add them together and well, multiply by 0.3 here. Um, and that's going to help fix those interpenetration issues. 
uh, that we talked about earlier. So um, if you want to go in and copy all of this through, um, that's going to give you a better result. Um, but we'll we'll leave that for now, and we're just going to sort of implement the basics here, uh, and then we can come back and edit and add that later if we uh, if we decide we need to. So. Um, so what is it doing? Well, we're getting our um, particle position. We're then querying the distance field uh, on the DPU. And so that's going to find out where that um, particle is, um, getting the normal or the field gradient. Um, and then just doing here a, a surface normal. So here, get, getting the, uh, the direction and length of that gradient um, to calculate the normal direction. Um, and then we're projecting input velocity onto the normal uh, and then we can kind of export that out again um, so let's do that ourselves so over in my actual project I'm going to jump over to scratchpad create a new module uh, and I'm going to call this call on surface um, just rearrange slightly my goes great it's very, very powerful, but it has quite a lot of screen space requirements, especially the scratch pad. Um, but there we are. So just copying this across. Uh, first thing we want is to get our collision query and our input position. So that's actually not. A, that's a new vector called position rather than the particle position uh, and then if we come up here um, we want the query mesh distance field QPU query mesh distance field QPU uh, just one thing to note um, this module or this node uh, only exists if you're coming from a collision query input pin so if I just right quick click and type in query we get a much smaller subset here, even with all the filters on. Um, so just one sort of uh, workflow note to make sure that if you are looking for the query node, if you can't find a node you're looking for, uh, try pulling off the uh, original pin or the pin that you're gonna be affecting. Um, <coughs> just some things are sort of hidden away. Okay, so we're gonna query the mesh distance field. So we're gonna say, right, find out where we are. Uh, the field gradient, that's our sort of rate of change of density which if we then take and apply a direction and length safe to, direction and length safe, um, we can then get our normal. So the direction of the gradient is effectively the same as the normal from that surface. Um, uh, okay, uh, and this, the way that this is done, um, we also need to multiply by minus one. We change this input to a float. That's to do with the direction of the density. Um, so it's high density nearest the surface and low density away, and we need to sort of swap that round um, to get the right normal direction to do our, our projection. Okay. Uh, I'm going to do another map get over here, just for convenience. We could use the same one, but can also use the same one twice that's fine or use different ones um, and we're going to get uh, another input vector that we call velocity and we're going to hook this up to the velocity coming from our kernel noise on our particles uh, sort of exterior to the module um, and then all we want to do is project vector to plane the vector is our direction whoops not length the direction will define the normal uh, and that will give us our new uh, new velocity uh, I believe the output yes particle velocity particle velocity like so so quick sort of overview of what we've done here uh, sampling the query or sampling the distance field again to say where we are. Um, the field gradient uh, is sort of the sort of change of densities um, will give us our normal and that will define a plane and then we're just taking whatever velocity we had as our input velocity and just projecting it down to make sure that we're only moving along the surface. Um, 
and then we can write that back to our particle velocity. So if I apply this and add it to our particle update, crawl on surface, give it a sec to compile. It's not going to move at the moment because we don't have our input set up correctly. So in here, our input position is just our particle position. And we could have done this within the module, um, but this also allows us to have a little bit more control and editing these things later. Uh, and our input velocity is just our particle velocity. What we should find now, if it compiles, it does take a little while to compile, just check the um, compile settings up here, um, that our particles are now aligned to the surface um, and they're moving along the surface itself. Um, and it's the combination of these two modules. So if I turn off the move to nearest distance field surface, uh, the second one, not the initial one, they'll start along the mesh, um, but you'll see over time they'll start to kind of like separate from the uh, from the surface. You saw one just sort of penetrate in there a little bit. Um, the floor is fine because it's flat. There's no sort of difficulties in, in coping with that surface. Um, but up here you can see they've started to kind of disconnect a little bit. And so um, one way to solve it is what they did in the content examples and multi-sample it. Um, and we'll maybe have a look at that next time. Uh, but the sort of easier way to do it is just reuse the uh, the move to distance surface and that will kind of like push things back um, to our uh, to our rock mesh um, there's a few errors with the interpenetration again um, the three sample method would probably solve that better um, but this works for um, for what we're doing here I think um, as a sort of base level cool couple more um, modules, a couple more kind of features we want to add before we finish up with this one. Um, the particles spawn within a box here, um, but then they just kind of wander off. Um, the curl noise is being applied, they're just going to eventually dissipate. Um, they're not going to die after a certain point and respawn, which would work. We could do that as a sort of solution to this. Um, you'd kill the particle off probably by scaling it down to nothing. Um, that's how I like to kill off my meshes and then spawn new ones by scaling them in again. That would definitely work. Um, or we could use another custom module uh, and that's what they've done in the content example. So that's what I'm going to be doing here as well. Um, if we jump back over to the content example. Uh, we have a module here called Avoid Box Edges. Um, again, it says a custom module. If we just double click it, it'll open up in the scratch pad um, and we can see kind of like what it's doing. So effectively, if you imagine you've got your kind of cube as your sort of bounding volume, um, it's just going to check, is the uh, is the velocity going to push you past the edge of that box? Uh, and if it is, well, just invert the velocity. Uh, and that will just kind of give us this sort of avoidance force. As you start getting close to the edges, you just get pushed backwards uh, and pushed back into the sort of to the volume that you've got there. So um, again, I'm just going to copy this. Uh, Sort of one by one uh, into our uh, into our example, and so come over here. New scratch module. Quick rearrange of the screen. Don't need you. And uh, we do a new module. Avoid box edges. Um, we've got a few different inputs. So in our initial get, I'm going to get a float. A second float the particle position, uh, the engine owner position, and the box dimensions, which is a input vector. And just name these. So that can be our fall off distance. So how close to the edges do we need to be before we start being affected? Uh, our force magnitude. So how how powerfully are we pushing away from those edges? And then the last one here is our box dimensions. So how big a box are we defining? And then the logic of this, if we take our particle position and subtract the owner position, so that's converting from kind of a, a world space to a local space, seeing how close we are. So we're dealing with the fact the uh, the particle system could be anywhere. Um, we are taking 
the half length of the box. So if we divide our box dimensions by two, give that to float. Again, this is um, because we're only looking, the box is defined as a whole value and we want to sort of check that from the center point. So that's from the, uh, from the origin. Um, then if I take the absolute of the subtraction and also the absolute of the box mesh, uh, that's just turning these into positive numbers because we're working from the box origin. That's obviously zero in the center positive values to one side, negative values to the other, but we don't want this to only work on the positive side. So by taking the absolutes, it's ignoring any negative signs that we had. Um, then we also want to take the sign of our, uh, of our particle thing. So finding out whether we're on that positive or negative side. Um, and I say, I'm just copying the, uh, the, the logic here from the content examples. So it's the absolute from the divide, subtract the other absolute. Divide that by the fall off distance. And then clamp and invert. One minus, I'm just going to clamp that between zero and one. Okay. Then the last thing to do is to reapply the direction of the movement, multiplying that by the output of the one minus, multiplying by the force magnitude. Okay, and that is now our new velocity. And we want to add that to the physics force. So I'm going to get our, what do I do? I'm going to get here physics. Oh, what's the thing here? Transient physics force. And take that. One sec, let me check what I did this before. Void box edges. So we add that to the physics force, come out with the end. Yeah, okay. So then here. I'm going to write out the. Ah, yes. So we're using here a special namespace. Um, so we need a parameter. How did I do this? One second. So we're writing to the transient physics force. So that will get picked up. So physics force um, is a module or a, a parameter that exists um, that gets kind of wiped every frame. Uh, so it's used in the calculation, um, at least this is my understanding, it's used in the calculation here, cell forces and velocity. Uh, if I add on parameter reads as well, yes, there we are. Um, so transient physics force, it's not a uh, defined parameter um, in the same way as something that we can edit. It's something that the engine is using to sort of do the physics calculations. Um, so it's re read, uh, and written by the um, cell forces and velocity module, um, which we can add to uh, with our own modules, um, but it's not kind of appearing as a sort of default get uh, sort of option there. Um, <clears throat> but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Uh, and so if we just create one with the same name, that will use that parameter that we want. So uh, transient physics force here exists within the um, cell forces and velocity. Um, and that's what we want to be working with. And so in our module, I remember where we have to create it. In here it is. So it's in the parameters stage transients. So where's my parameters? There we go. 
not enough screen space, everything's hidden away. There we are. Uh, anyway, let's say stage transients. If we create one here, um, I believe we should just be from uh, no, isn't it one? Okay, um, so this is going to be a vector physics. Get, this, get the right name because it's important. Force, not typo. Um, let me just double check it. Yes, transient physics force. Um, so now that we've kind of called this um, explicitly with that name, again, that already did exist. It just didn't auto complete uh, in the map get. Uh, now we should be able to go in and do that map get. Get the physics force. So we're going to be getting basically the forces that already apply to our particle and then check are you close to the edge? If you are, apply this sort of writing force, this negative force. <clears throat> if we're not, well, fine, doesn't matter. Uh, and the thing we're going to write that back to. Um, is the um, transient physics force. And that will then get picked up by the uh, solve forces and velocity module uh, and calculated. So we're just taking this one and adding this one. I believe, double check. Take the physics force, add the result of that physics force. Yeah. Uh, and that should work. So if I supply this, add it to my um, module stack, make sure that it's before the solve forces and velocity module, because this needs to um, to calculate before that sort of solve happens. Uh, and then we just need to plug in some parameters. Now this is where the box dimensions, we're going to use the user exposed one. Uh, force distance, or fall off distance, so I'm just going to set this to something small like 25 and then set the magnitude as well. Um, now, there's a problem with this. Um, it's sort of working, but our force is actually uh, incorrect. So you can see our particles are getting close to the edge of the box and then they're getting pushed outwards. Um, quite a cool effect, but the opposite of what we want. So if I put a negative value in there, now our particles should, as they get close to the edge, just get a little bit of a writing force that sort of pushes them back in. Um, quite a useful module. Um, as with all of our kind of Niagara scratch pad modules, if you right click here, you can create them into their own assets. Uh, and that's what I've done here. So these two here, the NM from Niagara module, uh, avoid box edges and call a long distance field. And that's gonna allow me to sort of keep them as a separate thing I can share and reuse in different places. Okay, getting quite a long video, but there's one more thing I wanted to just add uh, to this um, to this system. If we go back over to our sort of system overview, um, they're spawning on the mesh distance field. They're moving around. They're aligned to their velocity, and they're also aligned to the surface. Um, but they're all just kind of moving around at constant speed, constant rate. Um, could work. Could be fine, depending on what you're making. Obviously, the sort of input example here, or the sort of um, the example we're following, is that sort of staccato movement of insects. So they're sort of fast and then slow, and then fast and then slow. Um, and we're going to use quite an interesting module for that. One of the inbuilt ones, um, and it's called time-based state machine. Um, quite a complex sounding thing, but actually something that's quite a simple um, sort of premise, hopefully. Um, so if I just plug that in here, uh, I'm doing it above our force and velocity. Um, probably doesn't actually matter, but that's why I've got it for now. Um, and I'm just going to do a quick um, sort of preview. Uh, and so I'm going to create a, um, I'm just going to create actually a quick visibility tag. So if I go down to my mesh renderer, um, if I look in here, scroll down, scroll down, uh, we've got a um, renderer visibility tag binding. Um, and what we can do with that is up here, there's also a renderer visibility number input. Um, and so if I were to, for example, create a sprite renderer, and I'll set this to be uh, renderer one, and then the mesh to be renderer uh, zero, I can create a parameter, uh, set new or existing parameter directly. Um, now this one here, it's already been set, but it doesn't exist. So it's defaulting to zero. So visit particles dot visibility tag, 
um, doesn't exist, but if I come up here and create it, um, set vis, or sorry, visibility tag, um, what we should find, if we look at the preview, once it's compiled, so if I set that to zero, my mesh renderer is also set to zero. If I set it to one, my sprite renderer is set to one. So I can convert between different particles based on this visibility tag, or between different renderers. Um, what's quite nice about this is if I only have the mesh renderer visible, or mesh renderer in the stack, um, my visibility tag kind of works like a toggle on and off. Um, and so I'm just going to use this sort of property as a quick preview. Um, usually set this up sometimes when you're previewing a particle, you just want to quickly toggle something uh, or previewing some math. Um, usually do it with color, but you'd have to set the particle material up to take color and all those things, and that's not the case here. So as a quick kind of workaround for that, or a nice little um, kind of workflow tip, if you just create a visibility tag and then set that to between one or zero, um, that will just kind of basically toggle the visibility of your particles. Um, because it's trying to render a different sort of uh, renderer, um, which we don't have. So, um, so how does that sort of come into our time-based state machine? So, well, what this does is it kind of, um, I want to say, flip-flops uh, or kind of like um, oscillates between two different values or two different, um, two, yeah, two different inputs. Um, <clears throat> so we have uh, an on duration and an off duration. And then we have our lerp time to on and our lerp time to off. Uh, so effectively, all that's going to happen is it's going to take one second to transition from zero to one, one session, second to stay at one, uh, one second to transition back, and then one second to transition across. So we've got, got a, a kind of two, um, two state machine, two state options, um, and then some controls for how long to it takes to transition and how long to stay at that pos position. Um, and so here, if I come down to my on-off percentage, this is the output. Uh, I turn these on all the time, the reads and writes. It's really useful to see what inputs a module's taking, and even more Im importantly, what uh, outputs are being written to, because then you know what sort of data you have to, to work with and edit later on. So here I have my output time on-off percentage. That's basically the current value of this math. So that curve that kind of goes in and up and down, um, what's the current value of it? Uh, and that's here, this on-off percentage. Uh, and if I go in here, if I do a make int from float, I can plug in that on-off percentage. Um, well, let's just have a quick check for this first. So the int from float uh, module, or kind of, uh, I don't know what's the word for this, um, command, process, function, um, <clears throat> what it does is actually, it does a floor so the only way we get a value of one is by a value of one. Um, and so our time-based state machine output goes from zero to one, and our int from float goes from, well, it's only gonna do anything at one. So I'm just actually gonna multiply it by two, uh, multiply float, yep. And so if I take my on off percentage and multiply it by two, Hopefully, although a bit of a roundabout way of doing that, what we should see is our particles should just be on for a second and then off for a second. And you can see that kind of flicking behavior there. So our value from our on-off percentage uh, from our state machine goes from zero to one, multiplying it by two. Anytime it's above one, it's gonna floor back down to one. And so we get this kind of on-off visibility. Um, <clears throat> Bit of a, I say, long-winded way of, of sort of um, previewing what this module is doing, but hopefully that makes sense uh, and maybe shows kind of a nice way you can quickly just hack together um, sort of debug preview stuff that you might want to see. Um, so this is cool, but it's all very uniform. It's not very uh, organic. Well, we can change all these values. So if I say I want them to be uh, off for a much smaller value, you can see now we're going to be kind of like the it's actually the wrong way around. Um, so the on-off logic is backwards to the visibility logic, but the, the sort of uh, approach is there. Um, and you can adjust how long it takes to do that. Um, and you can create some quite sort of flickery, um, fast things. But what you can also do with these values is you can randomize them. And so if we say, um, I want to 
take somewhere between half a second and a second to transition to off. Do another random, half a second and a second to transition to on. And then I want to stay on somewhere between, I don't know, one and two seconds. And then I want to stay off again, random, between one and two seconds. Um, give that a second to compile. And what we'll find is we get this kind of really much more organic flickering where our particles are either on or off for a various amount of time. Um, and we're going to use this state machine now. We're going to use this value not to sort the visibility, uh, but to drive the velocity. Uh, if we multiply our velocity by this percentage value, what we'll get is fast movement and then stop, and then fast movement and stop. And each one of those movements and durations will be randomized by this random length, um, which is quite a nice thing. Uh, one last little thing about this. Uh, we need to, well, it doesn't make a huge difference, but we can uh, randomize the start time as well. So um, if we've got this curve that's randomly kind of going back and forth, we can also randomize the start time so that every particle is now really, really random. And like I say, we're not going to use it for the visibility. I can just delete that. It was a nice little preview, but no longer necessary. And instead, if we go into our particle, I'm going to do a set new or existing parameter directly. And I'm going to set particle velocity, set particle velocity, change this to a multiply vector by float. And so I want the particle velocity. Now there is another little gotcha here. Um, that does have it in there. Okay, fine. Um, so we're taking the particle velocity and then we're just multiplying it by a value. Um, make sure we're never really getting above one. Obviously if we do, this is going to be applied uh, a lot. <laughs> um, but if we take our on-off percentage, so on-off percentage output. What we should find is our particles should be moving a little bit and then stop and then move and stop. We might need to up our curl for strength. We've just applied a multiplier to that um, to that velocity. So before we had this constant velocity of whatever it was, 10, 15, um, all the time. Now that's mo mostly multiplied by a value less than one. Um, and so you just want to go in and increase your sort of noise strength. Um, I'm getting them off the surface. There is uh, some ordering requirements here. Um, so we're doing quite a lot to edit the um, velocities and movements. So we just make sure that we've got those um, in the right order. Um, so that should be before. That should be fine. Avoid box edges. Just again, clipping this with the um, example. Um, I think it was those two the wrong way around. So if we just let that compile. Yes, there we are. So we were setting the um, flight orientation and then we were also then updating it afterwards with the call on surface and doing it that way around was breaking the alignment. And you can see they're kind of coming off now. Um, but if we do it the other way around, order of operation does matter in this case. And now we've got our particles hitting the surface. So um, that's it for this video. It's been quite a long one. Um, as I say, it's quite a complex effect. We're not even, well, maybe halfway through, maybe a third of the way through. Um, but just to sort of quickly reiterate what we've done here, um, the move to nearest distance field surface GPU, reading the mesh distance field and just moving the particle there, um, and then random orientations, fine, works really well for sort of static things. And then as soon as we start trying to move them, we have to do a little bit more complicated maths in it. And so um, move to distance field surface again in the update, um, having to write a module to kind of check the surface to make sure that the velocities that we've got are being applied along that surface. Um, another custom module to just bring our particles back in again. Um, and then finally, this time-based state machine to control that sort of speed and velocity 
um, sort of changing between the two states of moving uh, and not moving. Cool. Hopefully that makes sense. As always, any questions or comments or anything, please do let me know. Um, I will be continuing this uh, in some future videos. As you can see, there's a couple of bugs coming in here. Um, we will just fix that one now. So I think what's happening here is it's reached a point in the curl noise um, that's basically zero. And so where we're getting these spinning, um, it's changing the direction, but not really adding any velocity. Uh, and that's actually quite a quick fix. So we'll do that one. Uh, do that now. Uh, in our curl noise force, if we just animate it with a bit of a panning motion, I'll just ensure that that sort of local zero uh, never gets um, never gets our particle stuck. So um, sometimes it can take a little while for that kind of thing to appear. But a little bit of motion on that will um, will make that work, hopefully. Um, so yes, as I say, um, hopefully that has been interesting and informative. Please do go and check out the content examples. Um, if you are going to copy through this yourself uh, and sort of compare how we've done here and, and what's there, uh, maybe even kind of try and do the next steps um, and see what else they've done in that. Because like I say, it's a really, really interesting and complex uh, module to go through. So um, as always, any questions, comments, um, please email me or leave them in the YouTube comments. Um, big thanks 